can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the homepage and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. First one is from Timothy Christus from Russia. He says, I still don't understand you, Pastor. Can you please explain again why masturbation is not a sin? Because without imagination, there's no masturbation. Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery. When one is masturbating, he imagines an evil thought which makes him to sin. So, sir, what do you say? I don't think it's a question of what do I say, it's what does the word say? Timothy Christus is asking, can you explain why masturbation is not a sin? Because without imagination, there is no masturbation. Maybe the first thing I'd like to ask is, um, what is masturbation in the first case? Secondly, are you do you practice it or have you spoken to those who do because you're telling us um, how it works so the important thing is what is sin that's the very first thing what is sin what I find in many Christians is that not many even have an understanding of the concept of sin. What is sin? Now, I have a, there's a teaching, and um, this teaching is in good detail. The title is The Concept of Sin. You need it. It'll help you understand what the Word of God calls sin. Remember, sin is not what we say it is. Sin is what God says it is. Sin is what God says it is, and that's very important. And you said something here in your question. You said, without imagination, there's no masturbation. Jesus said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery. Okay. Now, um, there's a second question that's coming that's connected to this one. I'll read that, then I'll answer both of you. This is from... Para Branda from Zambia. He says, Dear Pastor Chris, I'm one of the many believers that have been inspired and transformed by your ministry. I now know who I am in Christ. Now, I've been disturbed by news that is going around the internet that you said that masturbation is not a sin. I would like to hear it from you. Did you actually say masturbation is not a sin? 
and white. Wonderful. Why are you concerned about whether I said it or I didn't say it? Well, the, the question is, what does the Word of God say? Have you ever studied the Word for yourself? Now, whatever you think, the first thing you should do is go to the Word of God and study for yourself. Now, let me put it this way. If a man stole bread, a loaf of bread, from a shop, and eat it, does that mean that eating of bread is sin? Because he stole bread from a shop and he ate it. Was, where, was, where was his wrong? Did he go wrong because he ate bread? Does that mean that eating of bread is, is wrong? The problem is not the eating of bread. The problem is that he stole the bread that he ate. You have to understand the word of God. You, you said, you brought out something here in connection with what Jesus said, that whosoever look at on a woman lustfully, and Jesus actually said that, he said, had already committed adultery in his heart. Great. That means the sin was committed in the heart. So if you say that imagination goes with masturbation, where is the sin? The sin is therefore your imagination of sin. See, now if you, let me read you the words of Jesus in St. Matthew's Gospel. And I want you to listen to this very carefully because it will help you. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15. From verse 16, Jesus said, Are ye also without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast into the draught? But those, those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. You know what Jesus is saying? He says, your sin came out of your heart. It's not what you did with your hand. That's the problem. It's what caused whatever you did. That means your sin begins from your heart. So have this understanding. Jesus lets you know. It's not what you did with your hand that's the problem. It's what you did with your heart. You can have these imaginations while reading the book. You can have these wrong imaginations while you're eating your food. So the evil conceptions of your heart is where you've got a problem. So what do you clean, your hands or your heart? Your heart. So... Um, what I want you to do in, in helping yourself, because you're not going to accept something because somebody said so. You're going to have to know the Word of God for yourself. And I said, place an order for the teaching titled The Concept of Sin, the audio, um, the audio CD. The Concept of Sin is the title. It teaches you in the Word of God from the Old Testament to the New Testament, everything you've got to know what the Bible says about sin. What is sin? What does God think sin is? How does the Bible define sin? How do we deal with sin? It's all in that teaching. So that will help you. Jajit from Nigeria. Dear Pastor, what are the implications for a couple who are not wedded in church? but have fully concluded their traditional rights. Okay, that's very simple. What are the implications for a couple who are not wedded in church, but have fully concluded their traditional rights? There are two things here. Firstly, if that happened before you came to church, then that's not a problem because um, nobody knows about that anyway. You came as husband and wife to the church, whether you got married when you were Muslims, or you got married when you were... Uh, uh, 
Shintoists or Buddhists, whatever it was, wherever you did the marriage, when you come into the house of God, you are still married and you are children of God. And no one's going to be asking, oh, how, how did you do the marriage? You know, that's not a problem. So, however, um, if you've come like that, then the church does accommodate you without asking details of how you got married. We don't do that. But if you're already in the house of God, if you're already Christians, and while you are now in the house of God, you decided to get married, and you chose to do the traditional without the church, you got a problem. You're spiting the church, and that's wrong. You see, so the first, every child of God who wants to get married, before you make that plan, your pastor it must be aware. You don't just run off and come back with somebody else, or two of you just run off and get married somewhere and come back and say, now, uh, you know, we were here, um, singles, we, we went away, married, and we had come back. You'll be embarrassing yourselves in the house of God. So um, the implication, like you asked, is that you are spied in the church if you do that. So what are you supposed to do? First is the church before your tradition. See, it's the house of God that you conclude your arrangements for marriage before you go for your traditional. So don't go to the traditional and come from there to tell us we are now traditionally married and want the church to give us a blessing. That's nonsense. See, it's wrong. And some even make light of it and say, well, we got married somewhere, 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 and we are asking for church blessing. Is, is that all you think it is? Just a blessing? And if it's just a blessing, how blessed, how blessed is that blessing? How much blessing could that blessing be? So think about it again. Um, but if you've already done that, go to your pastor and report yourself. And say, we made a mistake and we're here now. Please forgive us. And they will forgive you and tell you what to do. Now, the pastoral ministry is so important. I, it can never be overemphasized. It's so important. Because, you see, it's in the church that the pastor can let you know how to dedicate your children. You know? Because sometimes if you come to church and you find on certain Sundays babies are being dedicated, you don't even know how come. You don't know how the church got to know that they had children. You know, because maybe you've just been a new member or you, you come to church only on Sundays and you just hear the announcements. There's a baby a child dedication. You don't know how they got to know. If you're part of the system, if you are in the relevant structures in the church, you will get to know. So if you're new to the church, the first place is once first time as are asked to wait behind or go somewhere to be addressed, go there. That's the first place. You will be addressed on that occasion. Now once you are addressed as a first timer, you'll be told to start a foundation class. Now the foundation class, as the name implies, it's the beginning. It's where you get started in the, in the ministry. Then they introduce to you the different aspects of the ministry, different things that you're supposed to do in your role as an individual and as a member. All of this information will be given to you. Then you get to know when people want to get married, who do they talk to? When people have a, a problem, um, some challenges at work, who do they talk to? You see, all these things will become clear to you through the pastoral ministry and the structure that is given to you in the house of God. Every Christian must be a member of a church. It is compulsory. It is compulsory. Now, if you have some, you know, there are those who say, um, I'm a member of the body of Christ. You say, where do you go to church? You say, I'm a member of the body of Christ. They are indisciplined. Mm -hmm. And it's stupidity. They're ignorant of the word. And when you meet such people, tell them to go to church and get humble. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. 
Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preacher's pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. First one is a question from Afa. Afa is from the UK. He says, "Thank you for your service and commitment to the body of Christ. To see it return to authentic Christianity." And he says, "Sir, I have two questions. What is the Christian position on the Grand Lodge?" He says in bracket, "Freemason." Is it right for a Christian to be associated with one? What does the Bible teach about? Now, this is the second question. His second question is, what does the Bible teach about soul ties? Are there good and bad soul ties? If there is, how am I supposed to walk in the light of this in building relationships? Wonderful. So two questions there. He's asking, is it right for Christian to be a member of the Grand Lodge because Freemason? Uh, and secondly, uh, what does the Bible say about soul ties? You want to say something about Freemason? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for this awesome opportunity. It's thank a great pleasure to be with you on this. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to read a scripture before I go on to explain that, that will be from Second Corinthians in chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Um, this is an occulting group, sir. And um, from what we read from the Bible, as a child of God, we are not expected to be involved in anything outside Christ. And um, a little bit about um, Freemason is that um, I found out they have some things they build their religion on. One of such is um, you give opportunity to listen to someone's opinion and live by that person's opinion and if you as a child of God you know you're supposed to live by the word of God then um, following that set is not what God has called us to be a part of thank you Maria, you want to say something? yeah Pastor um, just like Pastor Fonaby said um, if whatever that thing is even, if, even outside Freemasonry but whatever it is if it's not in line with God's word then it's not something Christian can, can be involved in. And yes, they do have opinions, um, set down rules and opinions, which don't align with God's word, and therefore uh, a Christian. Do you know any of such, any of their teachings? Um, a little bit, um, not extensively, but one of the things um, that they believe in is something to do with um, blood, uh, having blood relationships where they cut themselves 
and the probably that's why he's also asking about this that's why he's asking yes. about the soul ties yes sir so they they mix that together and that's supposed to join them in some kind of a relationship forever and i also understand that um you cannot mention the name of jesus in the in the group <laughs> and <laughs> any, any association that stops you from mentioning the name of jesus yes uh, i think that um, when you also, when you get born again, your values change, the people you associate with uh, change. I mean, you associate with um, the associates of the God kind. Mm -hmm. so. Now, it's important that you realize that in the world, there's so many different groups. And one group would say they're better than the other group. And... Um, Sometimes people think that until you've been a part of a group, you can't really say much about them, but it's not exactly so. What you need to do is study the word. Now, in the Bible, he shows us what kind of people to associate with. And all those people have the same way of life, really, because our, our purpose is to live like Jesus Christ. And he's our model. In Freemasonry, Jesus Christ is not their model. See, you've got to be smart about this. Jesus Christ is not their model. And the, their teachings are based on other materials, not on the Bible and the teachings of the apostles and prophets of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in our discipleship training programs, we study about other groups. And we have in-depth study on these other groups. So we're not just speaking widely. We've got adequate information on these groups. And this is not a forum for us to um, give you all of that information. I would say that you attend the discipleship training programs when you have one at your church. We organize these programs uh, regularly. So make sure you're part of it and you get to learn more. But from here, I can say to you that any group that's not headed by the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ with the teachings of the Bible according to the prophets and apostles of Jesus Christ we're not supposed to be a part of any such group and then secondly you're asking what does the Bible teach about soul ties the Bible doesn't doesn't teach about soul ties what it talks about soul ties is our tie with the Lord Jesus Christ it says, anyone who's joined to the Lord is one spirit. That's all the soul tie it teaches about. How we're tied to the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the spirit. Now, if you're talking about these false teachings. About people who um, think that they are soulmates and all those kind of teachings. It's all false doctrine. People are not connected together in this world by themselves and to themselves no our connection is to the lord jesus christ and that's what makes us that's that's what brings the rest of us together it's our oneness with christ that brings our oneness with one another if we if someone doesn't have that oneness with christ we don't have that oneness with him so there's no such thing about this kind of soul ties that are teaching about. It's all false doctrine. You better be careful. The Bible doesn't teach about soul ties outside the tie that we have with Jesus Christ. Based on our new birth through the word of God. So no soul ties, no soul mates horizontally. That means among human beings outside of Jesus Christ. So you don't need to find out how you're going to run your relationship with the teachings on soul ties. Run your relationships on the basis of the word of God. That's what you're supposed to do. John from Ghana. Sir, thank you for everything you have been doing for Jesus Christ. Pastor, please, I'd like you to explain how Cain married a woman since Eve never gave birth to a woman, where was this woman he married from? Does this mean that God has other creatures or had other creatures before Cain and Abel? No, he didn't have other, he didn't have other human beings before Cain and Abel. Um, he married one of, uh, 
one of the daughters of Adam and Eve. You didn't, you didn't study it fully. That's why you thought that they didn't have any daughters. They did. Now, I should just read that to you from Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4. It says, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth. Seth was the son after uh, Cain and Abel. It says, And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. See, he had sons and daughters after Seth. So, that lets you know that um, he didn't have only boys, he had daughters. Okay. Come over from Botswana. He says, good evening, Pastor Chris. I want to know what love is. How do I know if I love someone enough to marry them? What is that love? Mm. You do know what love is. Don't you know when somebody loves you? You know. You can know when you love someone. But hey, you know when God loves you, don't you? You know when you love God. Same thing. But if you're talking about um, loving someone enough to marry that person, it's, it's um, somehow um, wrong priorities. Because you're putting the wrong things first. You don't start out to know whether you love someone enough to marry that person. Because you may love someone enough to marry the person. But loving the person enough to stay in the marriage is a totally different thing. And so, what does God say? God didn't say in his word that you look out for someone that you love to get married to. What you need is God's guidance about who you should get married to. And then... When you now get married to that person, love the one you marry. So that's what the Bible says. If you love, if you marry someone, love that person. So he says, love your wife, love your husband. That's what he says. He didn't say, marry someone you love. He didn't say that. Quick vote question of the week. We'll give you four options and these are are all sicknesses from the devil and you didn't choose that praying for the dead you didn't choose that was the death angel in exodus from god and you didn't choose that then you chose can two souls be spiritually connected now these are questions we've selected from the several questions we get and we'll try to put them to vote so the one you vote the most for is the one we will pick among those several questions and this is the one you picked now the question really is According to Bible scholars, the connection in the soul realm between two people is referred to as a soul tie. It links their souls together and can bring forth either beneficial or negative results. How true or scriptural is this? Can the relationship between David and Jonathan in the Bible be referred to as a soul tie? Firstly, it is unscriptural, the doctrine of uh, having soul ties and soulmates is it's actually demonic it's some kind of demonic teaching it's it's um, uh, they may lift it from the scripture but it's a misleading doctrine now I'll explain that to you very simply sometimes what they mean by this soul tie is that God has connected certain people together in the realm of the spirit and so you have this mate in the realm of the spirit and that um, you've got to locate that spiritual mate or someone that God has died to you in the spirit realm and that until you locate such mates or whatever these ties are connecting you may not be successful or things may not work out for you and so on and so forth and they lift their teaching from the story of uh, David and Jonathan incidentally the two of them were young men I want to read that to you in 1st Samuel chapter 18 
verse 1. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And that was repeated for us um, in Scripture. Let us know how Jonathan loved David as his own soul. He says the soul of Jonathan was knit, that means tied, that's the same word, with the soul of David. Now, that should not be confusing in any way. It just means that he loved David. That's what he's trying to stress. You see, that's just what he's trying to stress. And when he uses the word soul, he's not trying to deal in the realm of the spirit, but letting us understand, for example, you know, man is a spirit, he has a soul, he lives in a body. Now, the soul is the seat of the mind, the emotions, and the will. See that? So the mind and the emotions are connected with love. And so he appreciated this David. He was the prince. Remember, he was the heir apparent to Saul, his father's throne. And um, he just loved David after David slew Goliath. He took interest in him. See, so uh, the, the construction that the soul of Jonathan was neat with David's soul doesn't refer to the doctrine of a soul tie but that he loved him see and the word soul there being introduced is not trying to talk about something in the realm of the spirit but that his mind was on him and his affection see so he's dealing there with affection now if you go over to the New Testament you will see the same thing so it's not an unusual situation at all in fact for us for all of us as Christians God expects that what you might want to call a soul tie if it's a soul tie then he wants every one of us to be tied together in the soul but um, not in the not in the kind of doctrine that's been pushed around Colossians chapter 2 from verse 1, For I will that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. That's the word again. Being knit together. And they pick the word tie. But it just means being brought together in love. And on to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So that's what he's talking about. That, I, you know, that, that their soul, talking about the brethren in that church, and that same thing for all of us. That our soul be knit together. That, our, that we all be knit together in love. That means having one mind. If you study in Philippians, he said the same thing. It says to have one mind. And one purpose. Pursuing the same thing. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see. So um, when you go back to Jonathan and David. That's exactly what he was looking at. The fact that Jonathan had affection. And the Bible says we should be kindly affectioned one to another. So that's what he's teaching. He's not talking about something in the realm of the spirit. You're looking for a soulmate of some kind. That doctrine is, uh, is not from God. So he's already brought us together in Christ Jesus, and um, it can't be stronger than that. Arden from Mauritius. Dear Pastor Chris, to protect herself from contracting a sexually transmitted disease, can a Christian woman divorce her husband, who is not a believer, since he has not stopped committing adultery and does it frequently? And according to 1 Corinthians 5, 9, we have to avoid relationships with immoral men. What is your comment? Well, very simple. If you would turn into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says from verse 10, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, 
let not the wife depart from her husband but and if she depart let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife so if you have a, a serious situation like this it's simple if you want to depart from your husband the bible says you can he tells you not to and then he says but if you do you remain unmarried otherwise be reconciled to your husband that's what the bible says so um count the cost of what you want to do before you do it Aaron from Botswana when God created Adam, he gave him the responsibility to tend the garden and dress it. But when he created woman, he gave her as help to man. Does this mean that the women are not meant to have a vision? It doesn't mean the women are not meant to have a vision. But it's a, there's a very simple thing there. If a woman is married to a man, uh, the simple reality is she chose to marry the man or if she, you know, somebody else said, well, I didn't choose, they, they forced me to. It doesn't matter how you became the wife. If you're the wife of that man, uh, what it means is that you, you decided or you are married to a master. Your husband is a master. And that's what it means. You now have a master and he does have a lot to determine what's going to happen to you. So even though you have a vision, it will have to be how your husband allows. That's what it is. You know, the Bible says that as Christ is the head of the church, he says, so the man is the head of the woman. Now, he didn't say every man is the head of every woman. No, he's talking about in a marital relationship where the husband and a wife have this relationship and the, the husband is the head of, of the wife. He's not the head of the neighbor's wife and is not the head of any other lady is the head of his wife therefore the vision that she has depends on him you say I don't like that but that's what it is what, what were you thinking when you got married that's what it's all about it's simple reality that's what the Word of God teaches now what, what if you've got a problem with this and you say um, I want to do something my, my husband doesn't agree and so I, I what do I do the thing is this if your husband is not submitted to Jesus Christ then he's got a problem because the Bible says as the the man is the head of the woman Christ is the head of every man you see and so he, he should he should respond to Jesus now if he will not serve God in Jesus Christ then that is a problem but you see there are several reasons that things like this you know problems like this happen and I, I don't want you to say oh yeah 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 that's my situation my husband is very rebellious to God if that's your situation go and talk to the pastor so that the pastor can look at it in a specific way and then guide you that's important because there are different cases sometimes a man might be hardened because of the behavior of his wife you see so if you if you talk to the pastor he may be able to advise you and tell you what more you should do and resolve issues at home You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos 
by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. question of the week we we'll gave you four options and these are our sicknesses from the devil and you didn't choose that praying for the dead you didn't choose that was the death angel in exodus from god and you didn't choose that then you chose can two souls be spiritually connected now these are questions we've selected from the several questions we get and we'll try to put them to vote so the one you vote the most for is the one we will pick among those several questions and this is the one you picked now the question really is according to bible scholars the connection in the soul realm between two people is referred to as a soul tie it links their souls together and can bring forth either beneficial or negative results how true or scriptural is this can the relationship between david and jonathan in the bible be referred to as a soul tie firstly it is unscriptural the doctrine of uh, having soul ties and soulmates is it's actually demonic it's some kind of demonic teaching it's it's um, uh, they may lift it from the scripture but it's a misleading doctrine and I'll explain that to you very simply sometimes what they mean by this soul tie is that God has connected certain people together in the realm of the spirit and so you have this mate in the realm of the spirit and that um, you've got to locate that spiritual mate or someone that God has died to you in the spirit realm and that until you locate such mates or whatever these ties are connecting you may not be successful or things may not work out for you and so on and so forth and they lift their teaching from the story of uh, David and Jonathan incidentally the two of them were young men I want to read that to you in first Samuel chapter 18 verse 1 and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul and that was repeated for us um, in scripture let us know how Jonathan loved David as his own soul he says the soul of Jonathan was knit that means tied that's the same word with the soul of David now that should not be confusing in any way it just means that he loved David that's what he's trying to stress you see that's just what he's trying to stress and when he uses the word soul he's not trying to deal in the realm of the spirit but letting us understand for example you know, man is a spirit, he has a soul, he lives in a body. 
Now, the soul is the seat of the mind, the emotions, and the will. See that? So the mind and the emotions are connected with love. And so he appreciated this David. He was the prince. Remember, he was the heir apparent to Saul, his father's throne. And um, he just loved David after David slew Goliath. He took interest in him. See, so uh, the, the construction that the soul of Jonathan was neat with David's soul doesn't refer to the doctrine of a soul tie, but that he loved you. See, and the word soul there being introduced is not trying to talk about something in the realm of the spirit, but that his mind was on him and his affection. See, so he's dealing there with affection. Now, if you go over to the New Testament, you will see the same thing. So it's not an unusual situation at all. In fact, for us, for all of us as Christians, God expects that what you might want to call a soul tie. If it's a soul tie, then he wants every one of us to be tied together in the soul. But um, not, in the, not in the kind of doctrine that's been pushed around. Colossians chapter 2. From verse 1. For I will that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Lord this year. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. That's the word again. Being knit together. And they pick the word tie. But it just means being brought together in love. And unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So that's what he's talking about. That, are, you know, that, that their soul, talking about the brethren in that church, and that same thing for all of us, that our soul be knit together, that, our, that we all be knit together in love. That means having one mind. If you study in Philippians, it said the same thing. It says to have one mind and one purpose, pursuing the same thing, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see, so um, when you go back to Jonathan and David, that's exactly what he was looking at. The fact that Jonathan had affection. And the Bible says we should be kindly affectioned one to another. So that's what he's teaching. He's not talking about something in the realm of the spirit. You're looking for a soulmate of some kind. That doctrine is, uh, is not from God. So he's already brought us together in Christ Jesus. And um, it can't be stronger than that. Sarah from Namibia. Dear Pastor, thank you for your answer on winning a gay person to the Lord. But I want to know, what if the person is making passes at you? This is my experience and it is quite disturbing. Yeah, uh, it's the same thing in, in uh, other cases. Because whether or not someone is gay doesn't stop that person from trying to make passes at you. For example, if you're witnessing to someone of the same sex and is gay he or she could be making passes at you or if you're witnessing to someone of the opposite sex who is not gay he or she also could be making passes at you but our reaction to such things should be the same deliver your message and then if you realize that this fellow He's only thinking of something else other than the message that you're bringing to him. Quit. That's it. Let someone else finish the matter. It's like, you know, dealing with a madman. You know that you're not making sense to that madman anymore. You got to stop and intercede for that one. See, because if you're talking to someone about Jesus, what you want is some, um, you want that individual to be reasonable enough to listen to you. But if he or she is not reasonable to listen, chances are they can't believe when they're not listening. So, 
um, we react the same in both cases. You don't get angry, you don't get mad, but you see, you, you just can't go on because um, that individual is thinking of something totally different. And so someone else has got to finish that job. Often we do this um, because a lot, of, uh, a lot of those who witness and meet people like this are often young Christians. And while they're still growing, we've got to help them uh, protect themselves from uh, crooked characters. And that's very important. But when you're a lot more mature than that and uh, strengthened, fortified from within, you also know how to deal with such people. You know, you, you know what to say, you know what to do. Uh, you tell them out of it. So you let them know that thinking is wrong. And the gospel helps them recognize that as you share the word. So you really don't run away. A quick vote question of the week. We give you several options, four options. The first one, why did God create us? You didn't choose that. Is it right to swear or take an oath? You didn't choose that. Clean and unclean foods, you didn't choose that, but you overwhelmingly chose our women, weaker vessels. Some Bible scholars often use 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 to portray their teachings in referring to women as weaker vessels. Does the Bible truly support the stand that women are made to be dominated by men or be housewives or childbearers? <laughs> All right, let me read the exact place for you. And then let's see the context. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and has been heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered very simple he didn't say he didn't say as unto the weaker persons he didn't call the women weaker persons he said weaker vessel that means uh, uh, it's indicative of something what do you use a vessel for what do you use a vessel for you don't wear a vessel do you no what do you use a vessel for Use a vessel to carry something. That means, he's saying to you, as weaker vessels, you should honor them with letting them do less physical work. That means less strenuous work. They should not carry heavy things. That's all he's talking about. That's all he's talking about. He uses the word weaker vessels, not weaker persons. If he had said weaker persons, then all these other things they're talking about would have been true. But he didn't say weaker persons, but weaker vessels. That means what you use them for should be less strenuous than with men. Amanda from USA. Can a woman be under a curse such that she can never find a man to marry her and her relationships break and never last? I am 40 this year and desperate to be married. I want to have kids as well and be happy. Please help. Firstly, it doesn't mean that um, if you get married and have kids, you will be happy because you want to be happy. Now, those are not things that make people happy. So get that point. It's very important. The people who have children, they're not happy. The people who, have, who are married, and they're not happy. So those things don't bring happiness. But if you're asking, can a woman be under a curse? Yes, a woman can be under a curse. Anybody could be under a curse. Depends on who's cursing you and for what purpose. But if you're a Christian, you cannot be under a curse. If you're born again, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ is a new creation, a new creation superior to Satan, you cannot be under a curse. Because the Bible says you're called to inherit a blessing. You cannot be cursed. Now here's the problem. If you don't know, it will not work. Truth unknown is powerless. Only truth that is known produces power. See? So, um, as a child of God, no one can put you under a curse. 
whether a man or woman, you cannot be under a curse if you know Jesus Christ, if you're born again and have the Spirit of God in your life. You can't be under a curse. So there are people who are in a situation like this and they think that maybe they are under the curse in their family or by themselves or something. And so they're wondering how to have the curse lifted. You don't need anybody to lift that curse because you're a child of God. The more knowledge you have, the more liberty of the spirits you will enjoy. So begin to take this today that even if anybody could be cursed, if you're a child of God, you're born again, you cannot be cursed. It just wouldn't work. Now, let's just for the records, if you were cursed as a child of God, who is to see to it that the curse produces results? Is it the devil? You have more power than the devil. Is it God? God is your father. Why would he supervise a curse against you? The only Christian who can be under a curse is the Christian who abandons the word of God. See? So, when you abandon the word of God, when you go away from God, when you reject the word of God, that in itself is a curse. That's where the problem is. Because you're outside the cover of God's word. That's the only way you can get to have a curse. The Bible says, He that despiseth the word shall be destroyed. See? So that's what the problem is. Megan from Canada. Does God recognize all marriages? Does God ever disapprove of a marriage union, thereby nullifying the marriage spiritually, even though the couple got married legally? God doesn't approve or disapprove of marriages. Marriages are man-made. Uh, individuals decide to get married. And so it's got nothing to do with God approving or disapproving. So the Bible doesn't tell us that God will disapprove of someone's marriage after the marriage has taken place and then nullify it spiritually. See, so that's not God's job. You have to understand that in a marriage, you've, um, you've bound yourself in a union to somebody, and that means that you've ordered words that God holds you over. You see, so um, that's an important thing you have to consider. The thing is, does God um, approve of a marriage to a chimpanzee? Does God approve of a, 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 a marriage of a man to a man, a woman to a woman? These are the things you may be asking. See, well, that means the total law of God or word of God is violated in such cases. And he does not need to nullify such a marriage spiritually. He doesn't. That's why he can hold you guilty of an offense because it's not his to nullify it's an action you have taken so you can actually marry yourself to a dog to a goat but then um you will be the one in trouble because that's up to you you made a decision just that your decision was wrong winnie from usa I would like to ask concerning homosexuality. What does God say about the lesbians and gay people? Is it God who made people to be like that? Because psychology tells us that some of those people are born bisexual and their sexual intercourse abnormal. All right, let me read. I've got several scriptures to read to you. And this will be very instructive. The first one will be from Romans chapter 1. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now what he's saying is this, that the invisible things of God can be understood by visible things around us. In other words, you look at natural things of life and you can have an idea what God's real will is, is and how to interpret spiritual things some spiritual things all right now verse 21 because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools now notice 
He's talking about a certain group of people who rejected God in their minds. I want you to notice what he says. Verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the cre creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, I want to read to you just in case you are wondering how to put these people in perspective who he's talking about i want to read verse 18 to you he says for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness he's talking about people whom god is angry with because of their behavior he says they hold the truth in unrighteousness they know the truth but they're not acting accordingly he says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. So they are without excuse. All right. Now, go back to verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Notice what it says about the women. They changed the natural use into that which is against nature. What's it saying? You get a glimpse of it. We'll read the next part. It says, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me you see that that's homosexuality he says the women left the natural use and went after that which is against nature he's referring to women and women then he says likewise just like them the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error so it's an error so god is saying it's wrong verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain god in their knowledge god gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient let me read to you God's mind about this thing right from the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lied with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's God's thinking. You see, he says, if a man also shall lie with man as he does with a woman, he says, both of them have committed an abomination. It tells you that God always kicked against this thing. It was never natural at any time. God always kicked against it. Let me read Deuteronomy to you. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. In the same way that he condemned a whore, he condemned a sodomite. A sodomite is a, is a homosexual. A gay. That's what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Mark effeminate. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. He says, these shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Effeminate is talking about those who are womanish. It's talking about boys, guys who act like women and are used 
as though they are females by their male counterparts. So those are the members of the gay community that act like women. They are effeminate. And then the next one he says, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's homosexuals. Newer versions will tell you that's homosexuals. He says they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I think that that's really strong. So God didn't make them to be like that. And it is not a, a deformity of some kind. It is a mental deformity rather than a physical problem. And if you have a problem with uh, homosexuality, you need prayer. You need, you need that devil to be cast out of you, cast out of your mind. Because it's, it's devilish, it's demonic. It's an oppression of the mind. You need to reject it, not to accept it. Don't have an explanation for it. From the scriptures I've read to you, God is absolutely against it. So don't explain it away. Now the quick vote question of the week. We've got four options here. Number one, what happens to animals when they die? Number two, resurrection of the dead at the rapture. Number three, is the belief in stigmata scriptural? And then uh, number four, is there anything like a spiritual husband or wife? And you chose the last one here. Is there anything like a spiritual husband or wife? Now many have been in situations where they believe they have a spiritual husband or wife. They say these people come to them at night and as such they are unable to get marriage partners. How authentic is this? Or is it an illusion? It's not an illusion. Um, it's an experience of certain people. It's a spiritual experience really. But these are experiences with demonic personalities. The truth is there is no such thing as a spiritual husband or wife. But demon spirits who are... Um, oppress and manipulate individuals who are ignorant or who have grown up under some demonic influences and so these demons continue to oppress them lie to them and um, uh, manipulate their minds so it's not an illusion it's a real experience but every Christian whoever finds himself in such a situation must learn to cast out devils you reject the authority over you because jesus christ is lord of your life and these demons have no power over you and you must demand that there are manipulations and um, uh, activities in your life must stop if you demand that they stop they will stop Clifford from South Africa passed over the years in the world over women have had rights forums so much that they no longer submit the, to their husbands we cannot compare our wives to our mothers pastor how do we handle this in our homes spiritually thank you sir <laughs> definitely you cannot com compare your wife to your mother I know what you mean by that uh, when you say you cannot compare your wife to your mother you're trying to say that your mother was very um, uh, submissive to your father and now uh, the wives of today are not as submissive as mothers used to be well you are not your father and um, you didn't marry your mother so you can't tell what your father went through exactly so um, don't pretend to know that well I, I don't think that the rights the women's rights forums were uh, uh, particularly directed towards uh, problems between them and their husbands. They were not trying to gain their rights on their husbands. I think they were doing more with the larger society. So uh, I, I'm not sure that that's what those forums were supposed to produce. They were not supposed to produce uh, stubborn women. I don't think so. But if you have a problem of submission that is to say where a wife doesn't submit to the husband 
then it means that that woman has a problem with the Word of God because the Word of God calls for it. You know, in, in every family, um, there must be the head of a family. You know, in a, in a marital relationship, both are not the same. The Bible says the, the, the man is the head of the woman. So, the, and that submission is a responsibility for the woman. So now, I, I don't think that if you try to preach it to her, you know, tell it down to her that, that that's going to be a solution. But um, learning God's word is always the best way to guide our zeros in the way of truth. And Christian women ought to learn that this is not a matter of a man trying to rule over a woman. You chose to get married. And when you choose to get married, you understand that you are submitting yourself on authority. That's what it's all about. It's not a partnership of equal members. You know, you're equal in the presence of God for your salvation and all the rights of salvation. But you're not equal in authority in the home. And it's just that simple. And that stubbornness will not help. If a woman is stubborn to her husband, it will not help. It will destroy your husband's love for you. So, um, getting the right teaching along this area, along these lines, will be very, very helpful for every woman. And of course, you know, the men should know what their responsibilities are as the women learn their responsibilities. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.